really inspired this week. She chose three of my favorite songs in all the world. And I didn't even ask her to. <laughs> Count your blessings because he lives. And I stand in awe of Almighty God. Well, uh, last night we spent our last night in our early parsonage. And I just want to thank you for providing <clears throat> that uh, house for us during our time here. It's been a real blessing, a uh, <clears throat> place of comfort and refuge and refreshment. And uh, so thank you to the congregation for <clears throat> providing that for us. For those of you uh, who have not been with us, or for those of you who perhaps have forgotten, we're uh, wading through the powerful little book in the Old Testament of Habakkuk. And in just a couple of moments, we will read uh, chapter 3 in that book. From the moment Alexander wakes up, things just don't go his way. Calvin winds up in his hair. He trips over his skateboard. His brothers find amazing prizes in their cereal boxes, but his box has only cereal. He doesn't get the window seat on the bus on the way to school. And at school, his teacher doesn't like his picture of the invisible castle. <laughs> he sings too loudly. He leaves out 16 when he counts to 20. His friend Paul deserts him for his third best friend. There's no dessert in his lunchbox. After school, the dentist tells him he has cavities. The elevator door closes on his foot. Anthony pushes him in the mud. Nick says he's a crybaby. Mom punishes him for, pun for punching Nick. <laughs> At the shoe store, they're out of blue sneakers with red sprays. At home, he has lima beans for supper. There's kissing on TV. At bath time, the water's too hot, he gets soap in his eyes, and he loses a marble down the drain. His nightlight burns out, he bites his tongue, and he decides he wants to move to Australia. <laughs> Well, like Alexander, uh, many of us have experienced those kind of days, perhaps those kind of weeks, or months, or years, or decades, or perhaps lifetimes. We are looking in the book of Habakkuk at four principles of life that change this prophet from a complainer to one who is content, from a man of confusion to one of confidence. And he has looked at his beloved nation, and uh, he has, like Alexander, concluded that things are really, really bad. He looks at the sinfulness of the people. He looks at the slackness of the law. He looks at the siege of the righteous and the silence of God. He waits on God. He waits for that appointed time when God will act and will speak and will no longer be silent. Four principles that change Habakkuk's entire attitude. The first is faith. Faith is trusting God no matter what. Faith involves the past, the present, and the future. We were saved by faith in the work of Jesus Christ. We now live by faith, and we look forward to that time when the whole earth will be full of the glory of God. The second principle that uh, Habakkuk urges us to have is that of silence, to stand dumbfounded before the awesomeness and the majesty of God. And we discovered that 
the Lord is in his holy temple, <clears throat> let all the earth keep silence before him. The Lord is exactly where he should be, doing exactly what he should be doing. Now we come to Habakkuk chapter 3. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them or revive them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise, rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth, he looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Cushion in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nation. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. <clears throat> you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. <clears throat> he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Faith Silence, and the third principle that changed the attitude of the prophet Habakkuk is that of prayer. This is a prayer, and prayer is always the best thing to do. And it transforms Habakkuk from the pit of despair to contentment and peace and confidence. David sinned and he prayed. Moses despaired and he prayed. Jesus, battling with the Father's will, prayed. And Paul said, don't be anxious, but rather pray. And the peace of God that keeps your hearts and minds will bring change to your life. And Paul in Romans chapter 8 says, even if all you can do is moan or groan, the Holy Spirit interprets our inner desires to the throne of the Father. Prayer is heard and understood. Habakkuk's prayer is saturated with strong emotion. He's overcome at the wrath and the power of God. And indeed, it is a burden for him. He embraces the struggle of his people. There is awe and joy and confidence and fear. Now, Habakkuk's prayer includes three realities. The first that we see is humility. Habakkuk is no longer arguing or questioning or dictating to God 
what he ought to do. There's no request to spare the people. It's a recognition that God, what God's ways are absolutely right and just, and that judgment is deserved. Humility, because of the grief of sin, grief that is caused because of his own sin and the sin of his people. He says, I have heard you. I have seen you. And now there is a humility. There is grief because of sin. And there is a concern for the glory of God. He stopped thinking of, in terms of the Babylonians who were worse than the Israelites because once you get a vision of God that the Lord is in his holy temple with sinful man and the universe beneath him, the distinction between Israel and the Chaldeans or the Babylonians becomes relatively unimportant when he sees the holiness of God. And then it is no longer possible to be exalted as an individual or as a nation because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The whole world is evil and condemned. And so his only concern now is the holiness of God. And he humbles himself before God. There is a spirit of repentance. He grieves for Israel and he grieves for the Chaldean, Chaldeans. So his concern is for the glory of God. And that is the attitude that begins revival. They say that a growing Christian is like a head of wheat. The more mature a head of wheat becomes the lower it bows. And so it is with a growing Christian. So there is humility. The second thing that Habakkuk's prayer includes is adoration, worshipful adoration. There is real fear. God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Hebrews 12 says, Let us worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And so there's this mixture of real fear combined with an awesome respect for who God is. And there is fear and there is also wonder. That is adoration. There's a third aspect of the package prayer, and that is request. He's asking. And note what he asks for, and also note what he does not ask for. He does not ask for deliverance, no suffering, or a change of God's plan. His first request is that God's work may be renewed or revived. So his first request is a request that should be on the hearts and minds of all believers at all times, and that is revival. In the midst of years, with all this awful stuff and calamity and judgment, we pray that God's work may be revived. I don't know how many of you were watching TV or Facebook yesterday, but uh, our capital, Washington, D.C., was taken over by believers repenting and praying for our nation. It was indeed a, a profound event and a profound sight to see. And it, it brings to mind some questions. What worries us the most? The prosperity of the church or the purity of the church? Or which 
which are we most concerned? Are we most concerned for the name and glory of Almighty God? Does the complacency of the church concern us just as much as worldwide terrorism? Is our primary concern for America or for the kingdom of God? Revive. Revival means two things. To preserve or to keep alive or to bring alive that which has died. And it also implies purification. There is no revival without repentance. So first his request is that God may revive his work among his people. And secondly, he says in wrath, remember mercy. He appeals not to Israel's righteousness, or he doesn't say, well, there have been worse times, but rather he appeals to the other side of God's nature. He recognizes the wrath of God and his right to perfect justice. But he also asked God to remember mercy. Temper your wrath with mercy. Sow seeds of restoration even as you destroy. He has nothing to say but to ask God to act like himself. And in the midst of perfect justice, also show us your pity. Show us your mercy. The book of Hebrews says, Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he disciplines, he proves his love by his discipline of his people. And that is Habakkuk's attitude in prayer. Humility, adoration, and humble request that God would revive his work and that he would show mercy when mercy is not deserved. Finally, prayer is the third principle. The last principle is that of peace. And we find that in verses 17 through 19, some of the most amazing words in all of Scripture. Habakkuk says, Although the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, although the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Savior. Rejoicing in the all those of life. How is that possible? Well, it's possible, first of all, because Habakkuk recognizes that the Lord God is his strength. He has no strength on his own. He relies totally on the sovereign, almighty God. The Lord is my strength. The second thing that brings him peace is a recognition that God's purpose and God's people will never be destroyed. They may be judged, they may be pruned, they may be purified, they may be humbled, but they will not be destroyed. Now when you look at the all those that Habakkuk mentions, the fig tree, the vine, the owl, the fields, the flocks, and the cattle, those are precisely the six things upon which the livelihood of the nation Israel depended. What he's saying is, even though everything is taken away from us, and there appears to be no hope, yet I will rejoice in the Lord my God. Here's the land that once flowed with milk and honey, and now Habakkuk only sees destruction and poverty and desolation. And he says, although all these calamities occur, yet I will rejoice in the Lord of my salvation. Much like Job, who said, 
God, you can, you can kill me. Though you slay me, I will still trust you. Or like the, the three Israelites there in Babylon before the fiery furnace. He said, we're not going to bow down to you. God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down to you. That's the attitude of the battle. Even though the worst happened, even though all these things, these calamities may occur, I will rejoice because the Lord is my strength and my hope is that God's purpose will never be destroyed. What might be the parallel if there were a prophet among us speaking these last words in chapter 3? He might say, although I lose my job, although I lose my health, although my 401k tanks, although the city is burned, although my children wander far from God, although my marriage is a constant struggle rather than bliss, Although my nation turns its back on God, although my church is not perfect, although my political party loses, although it seems that everything tied down is coming loose, still, yet I will rejoice in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He enables me to hang on, to cling to His promises like a deer in the heights or like a mountain goat sure-footed and confident and brave among the boulders and the cliffs. Now in your outline, I have suggested that we take some minutes and that each of you think about your own life right now. What are the all those that you're dealing with? What are the calamities, they might be big, they might be small, that you're dealing with. It might be your health, it might be your finances, it might be your job, it might be family relationships, it might be the upcoming election, it might be our nation and everything that is happening, or it might be something else that you want to list. Let's take a couple of moments and you think about your life and what you're dealing with now. Check what category concerns you. What category tempts you to despair? And then let's give it to God. Let's rejoice in God our Savior. God, we praise you for your presence, not only in times of prosperity and blessing and joy, but also in those times when we struggle, when we are overwhelmed, when we see no way ahead or no way out. We thank you that as we are honest before you, give you our life. The worst can happen, but we have you, and we praise you for that reality. Amen. Now don't forget, there apparently were no changes in the conditions that Habakkuk was dealing with. He in effect said, though conditions wax worse and worse to the very worst imaginable, 
My new fought, found joy will not be touched or tinged, for my joy is in the Lord. Sometimes we're asked, well, how are things going with you? And we sometimes reply, well, not bad under the circumstances. And that's the problem. We usually are under the circumstances. But these last few verses in the back of chapter 3 tells me that God enables us to live above the circumstances. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on to the heights. So it was with the back 2,600 years ago. And so it is now. May we in faith take that journey from complaining to conflict. From our burden to God's blessing. And may we find our joy and strength in God alone.